Good afternoon, everyone. MD Publishing would like to welcome you to our special FDA webinar for medical equipment sales and service industry. This is a very important webinar for many different segments of the industry, and we are pleased to announce we have over 750 pre-registered attendees for today. This strong showing is a clear and powerful indicator of the importance of today's presentation. When the FDA announced the establishment of a docket to receive information and comments on the medical device industry and healthcare community that refurbish, recondition, rebuild, remarket, remanufacture, and service and repair medical devices, MD Publishing took the lead along with other leading organizations in industry like Amy to ensure that the industry had a forum to gather and inform all parties involved. To get started, I'd like to review the three major events that were leading up to the May 3rd deadline for comments on the FDA site. Back on March 16th, we formed a steering committee to start the dialogue about today's discussion. We formed an expert panel for a Q&A session, and then we discussed ideas to promote the webinar that's happening actually today. Um, today, we're actually holding the webinar that we have the leading experts in the industry. And then on Friday, April 22nd at 9 a.m., we're going to be holding a special meeting at the MD Expo for all the people that are going to be present at the event. It was of utmost importance that we have all industry parties represented today, from ISO to third party to hospital end user, so that a broad perspective from everyone was shared and information gathered. Today's expert panel is comprised of unparalleled and authoritative leaders from each industry segment. All of this is leading up to our ultimate goal, which is to create enough awareness for the entire industry from all segments to leave positive and influential comments regarding the value of refurbishing, reconditioning, rebuilding, remarketing, remanufacturing, and servicing medical devices performed by third-party entities on the FDA comment section of the official docket webpage. Again, this deadline is May 3rd. I would like to now introduce our expert panelists, starting with our moderator, Dave Francoeur, representing ISOs from Sodexo, Manny Roman, Independent, Mary Logan from Amy, Matt Tamore from Conquest Imaging, Rick Staub, Intermed, Chris Nowak, Doug Dreps, representing healthcare users, Jonathan Gay from ECRI, Jason Crawford from Block Imaging, Wayne Webster from IMERS, and we also have special guest Ben Sing Wang as an independent, and Ryan Cleva representing IMS slash Steris. Dave Francoeur, you can take over whenever you are ready. Thank you very much, John. I really appreciate it, and I want to thank you again for using MD Publishing as a vehicle to help the profession in this great opportunity that we have. I wanted to um, just take a couple minutes to talk a little bit about what we're going to try to accomplish today and uh, what the agenda might look like for the next hour, hour and a half, whatever that is. So as John indicated, um, we have an opportunity to respond to the FDA. We're hoping that it will include responses from the original equipment manufacturers, parts companies, third-party service providers, repair companies, independent service organizations, in-house HTM departments, hospitals, and also anyone that might support the medical equipment industry. So with that, I believe our challenge and the opportunity that's presented to us today is around our having the ability to paint a very vivid picture of what our industry is about, how it works, and how it intermingles with each other, and how all these entities play well together and how they get along. It's for us to take that vivid picture and tell a very compelling story. The better and the more information that we provide to the FDA, the better off we're going to be. So I would ask that everyone uses this opportunity to share this with anybody else that you don't know about that's on this call, or that you know about that's not on this call, as an opportunity to get them engaged and involved. It would be beneficial for all of us. So what we're going to do is we're going to first start out with that very prestigious panel that John alluded to a few minutes ago. We're going to ask each one of them a question, and we're hoping that they'll answer within a three to five minute category. Once that's done, we then hope to go through the seven questions that FDA is looking for. Randomly, I'll pick a few people to answer each one of those seven questions, and get some feeling around from their perspective what that looks like. Then we'll have the ability for any of you guys that want to ask questions over on the right-hand side of your screen in the chat portion, you'll be able to ask a question. Hopefully, we can address a few of those through the panelists. And then we'll just open it up just in general, and then we'll close it up. So um, at that point, that's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of be going along and see how that goes. So with that, as uh, you guys have already done, thank you. 
we're going to go to the first one. So from your perspective slash segment, and I think it would be valuable as, as a panelist once you're called upon, is to take a second and just kind of describe your segment, where you're coming from and why you feel that, you're, that is your segment. And then if you could, what do you think the intent of the FDA is regarding this, annou this announcement? What are they trying to accomplish? And with that, only because she's been so good at it in the past and such a great person to set the stage, I'm going to ask Ms. Mary Logan from Amy to start that off for us. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be on the webinar as a panelist and to, uh, to speak to this issue. So uh, I've worked uh, with the FDA for a number of years. I have responded to Federal Register notices throughout my entire career. And I, the number one piece of advice I can give to everyone is don't try to read more into a Federal Register notice than what is written there, especially when it's a request for information. And that's exactly what this is. So uh, when thinking about intent, um, I have heard a million versions of what, the, what people think the FDA is intending to do on phone calls and emails. Is this what they're doing? Is this what they're doing? And it's amazing to see the stories that can come out of uh, fear, worry, conversations that you've had with someone else. Always go back to the Federal Register notice. The person who is the point person on this particular Federal Register notice is Valerie Forney. I have worked with her before. She is an awesome, outstanding, thoughtful leader at the FDA. And I trust, when I saw her name, I said to myself, OK, this is awesome because she's going to do a really thoughtful, thorough um, job with this. And she cares a lot about information. So that's exactly what they're looking for, is information. They have said that some stakeholders, this is quoting from their, uh, their notice, some stakeholders have expressed concerns that some Third-party entities may use unqualified personnel to perform service maintenance, et cetera, and that the work performed may not be adequately documented. Possible public health issues arising from these activities include ineffective recalls, disabled device safety features, and improper or unexpected device operation. So they need to know, are these concerns valid? And they've asked a series of questions to try to get real data and information to help them better assess whether the concerns that have been expressed to them are valid. So we are urging everybody in the field, across the field, to provide responses to the FDA. And it won't be helpful to them if your responses simply stay out of our business or there is no problem here or, or just opinion. They really are intending to read, to listen, and in order to get the best information they can, you have to really provide them with detail and with as much concrete information as you can. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mary. As usual, it's a great, great uh, stage setting comments and questions. So with that, you know what? I want to go to Matt Tamori. Matt, if you don't mind from Conquest Imaging, would you like to uh, respond to the same question, please? At your mute button, probably. OK, how's that? Awesome, thank you. Terrific. All right, well, um, most of you know me, but I'm from Conquest Imaging. Um, Conquest Imaging has been in business since 2000 as an ultrasound parts service training and tech support provider. Uh, so we very much have a stake in this. Um, my background uh, over the last 30 years, uh, I have done service sales training uh, tech support, technical writing. Uh, so I've really touched all aspects of the business. And uh, like Mary, I believe the FDA is looking to be educated. Um, I know they are aware of who we are and what we do, uh, but there's a lot of detail about our business that we need to, uh, I think we need to share with them. And so um, we, we've read into this. We've had several meetings about this. And that's the perspective that we're taking is to illuminate as much about um, our take on this business as possible. Great, Matt. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate that. Mr. Nowak, how about yourself? Could you help us out a little bit from um, you know, the healthcare end user's perspective? 
Sure, Dave, and uh, thanks for allowing me to be present on this. Um, Dave, uh, my uh, perspective on this is uh, truly an educational opportunity um, for all of us, as Mary pointed out, and I think primarily uh, also an educational opportunity for um, the OEMs. Uh, from our perspective, um, you know, some of the NPRM talked about uh, the competency of staff and things like that. So I I'm really going at this as an opportunity to educate uh, the FDA and hopefully an end result, the OEMs, about our staff uh, and also about some of the regulatory pressures that we uh, face just like the OEM. And what I'm referring to is um, you know, the OEMs have a, a, a GMP requirement, good manufacturing practices requirement that they have to adhere to. They establish a medical device file for every one of those devices that are manufactured in their facilities. And quite frankly, as, a, as an end user, as an in-house user, uh, that medical device file gets extended to our CMMS product. So our CMMS product becomes an extension of the original uh, medical device file. So I'm, I'm looking to educate the, uh, the folks about that CMMS and what it does and where it picks up from the manufacturer once the device is delivered on site. And then, of course, the competency uh, of, of my in-house staff versus competency of the OEM uh, service staff and hopefully maybe open up some channels for uh, more transparency from an educational perspective uh, rather than having an us and them kind of uh, uh, situation between the OEM and a potential in-house person, really establish more of a transparent working relationship and have access to the appropriate documentation to properly repair devices um, that we purchase from those manufacturers. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Chris. I, I think that was a real nice overview and perspective, so thanks again for your time. Um, I'd like to go with somebody that's more of an independent perspective at this point and, and um, a very world-renowned, renowned, uh, recognized voice in the industry, and that would be Mr. Roman. Manny, would you like to share with us your thoughts? Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, I appreciate uh, MD Publishing uh, doing this. Uh, th this is a, a, a needed uh, forum and, and uh, John uh, and his group are doing a great job. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, I have uh, worked for manufacturers. I, I, I uh, back in the early 80s, I began working with Picker International, uh, and uh, then I went to work for Philips. Uh, so I worked for two OEMs. I'm one of the founders of RSCI, and I'm one of the founders of Ditech. Um, uh, so I, I've been in the training and support industry uh, and, uh, and the diagnostic imaging uh, part of it for a very long time. Um, I am now serving as the um, uh, Association of Medical Service Providers uh, Business Operations Manager. Um, so I'm representing an association of independent service organizations. I also work for Crest Services uh, as a independent as a leadership development. Um, so I kind of have been around a, a while. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the, the question is, what, you know, what is the FDA doing? Uh, well, obviously somebody tweaked them and uh, they responded. Um, now, when you gather information uh, and you go through all this process of gathering information, there's got to be a, a reason behind it, and, and uh, what will they do with it? Um, so the, if the information it goes in one direction, they probably will go in one direction and in the other direction and the other direction. So, uh, you know, there's probably, I don't know, over 30,000 people that uh, service equipment, and I don't know what the uh, others, the independents, uh, the market, uh, the refurbishers and all that, uh, which I'm terming as others, I, I don't know how many people there are, but I don't think the FDA is looking to put anybody out of business. Uh, you know, they'd be putting hospitals out of business, uh, you know, all kinds of things. I think their concern is safety. Somebody, somebody tweaked them on safety issues 
and of course they have to respond they have no no choice so in order for them to respond appropriately they need information and that information is what they're they're requesting uh, we as an industry uh, need to provide them the appropriate information uh, and uh, you know as, as Mary said people the immediate response is to get all freaked out about you know what are they going to regulate us what are what are they going to do um, I, I, I think that in our responses we need to be careful not to do stupid things like uh, say well we, we can't do a good job because the uh, manufacturers are not uh, not providing us any information. Uh, this other industry is doing a great job and a safe job in spite of uh, what other what, what impediments uh, the manufacturers place or, or, or whatever other issues there are. We're, this, the, the others are doing a great job and a safe job and I think that that needs to be the focus of whatever replies we have. Um, if you don't want, to, uh, I'm assuming you don't want to be regulated. Now, if you want to be regulated, then you, you know, then respond accordingly. So uh, they're either going to regulate or not regulate, and it's going to be according to what what the responses are. And I, I believe that that is uh, what what they're attempting to do, trying to decide whether they need to take some action. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate that insight and perspective. Let's go to, if you don't mind, Jonathan, Gabe, are you available? Are you on the line with DCRI? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure many people know ECRI Institute. We're an independent, nonprofit organization, and our goal is to improve patient care. And we accomplish this through our research, publishing, education, and consultation. We've done this for over 50 years. And we began by testing medical devices in our laboratory and reporting on the results. And I work for that group. Uh, we also help our clients with uh, medical device recalls. And that includes information from the FDA, international information we have, and some proprietary information. So I think we're very well known in the health technology management community and many, many of our members service and repair medical equipment. Uh, by the way, as an employee, I cannot uh, consult for a medical device company or even own stock in a firm. We have pretty strict conflict of interest rules, so we ourselves do not service equipment and, and we also do not, not sell it. We did, the uh, FDA reached out back in 1997 and 1998, and they had a, quite a similar initiative, and they asked for help from the community and understanding issues related to medical equipment. We participated in that event and we're pleased to contribute to the discussion about this current initiative. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Mr. Crawford, Jason Crawford, are you available? Would you like to speak? Yes, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm Jason Crawford, president of Block Imaging Parts and Service. Uh, block imaging uh, has 35 staging bays, lead line staging bays here in Holt, Michigan, uh, where we stage and refurbish hundreds of pieces of medical imaging equipment a year, uh, turning those through our bays, uh, sending our engineers out to install uh, those systems here in the United States and sell them around the world. Um, and to, to answer uh, the question asked about the uh, motivation and intent of the FDA, certainly I agree with uh, some of these other industry leaders who have said, their, their primary intent is and will always be patient safety. That is, that is the role of the FDA. And, uh, and, and to put myself in the FDA shoes and see that while there is a high burden placed on the manufacturers in our industry uh, to put out safe equipment uh, and, and, and verify and validate that that equipment is going to continue to perform safe patient care for years to come, uh, there is a visibility to the FDA of that process and a safety reporting back to the FDA of, of adverse uh, events, particularly within uh, what we focus on, which is primarily x-ray emitting devices. Um, what the FDA uh, is saying through this process is that what they don't have today is visibility to what the third party is doing in the same way that they have that visibility for the OEMs today. 
Uh, and I think we have to take that request seriously and, and recognize what are the opportunities that we have as a high quality industry to provide that visibility in what is happening in the service and the repair and the refurbishment work that is happening on medical equipment that is going to uh, serve patients. And, and obviously, if not done professionally and in a high quality way, uh, runs the risk of doing harm. Uh, there was probably a time when our industry was a bit of the Wild West. I, I think that our industry is better than ever in terms of policing its own. Uh, the market today comes with transparency about who's doing a great job and who's not. Uh, and, and also what is happening today in vendor uh, audits, uh, the process that we have between hospitals and third parties uh, to cooperate with one another in finding ways to get better uh, and more consistent in what we do. And, and I will say, while it's not always perfect, the cooperation we get, particularly in the x-ray side of things um, from the OEMs, is, is a, a relatively high level of cooperation today. Uh, an, an OEM uh, industry that understands that they have a role in supporting the third party, supporting hospital uh, healthcare technology uh, team members in getting the information they need in order to make sure that medical devices are being uh, maintained and serviced, uh, meeting levels of quality and safety. I think there's far more that we can do as an industry to not only create more visibility of what's happening out in the industry, the majority of medical devices today uh, in this marketplace are being serviced by someone other than the original manufacturer. And, and I think it behooves us to find ways to create visibility in the process so that the FDA and the third party can hold ourselves accountable uh, to the way medical devices are being maintained. Great, that was wonderful. Thank you very much for your oversight. Mr. Dreps, are you out there? Are you available, Doug? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Everybody's made uh, great comments. Um, yeah, a lot of things they said I, I definitely echo. Uh, my background has mainly been in hospitals for 31 years, but I did work for uh, three different OEMs uh, for a seven-year period where, uh, you know, I not only represented them on their equipment, but we also were an ISO and worked on other uh, equipment from other manufacturers. Um, so I echo, um, I think the FDA is looking, um, you know, for information from us, and I think this is an opportunity uh, for really us to tell them all that we do, because uh, we do a lot. Um, Chris brought up the, we have to meet the regulatory compliance of CMS, uh, and whether you're the Joint Commission or DMV. Um, <clears throat> so our records and, and you know, using ISOs, using OEMs, um, you know, we've done it all. And, yeah, there are some problems uh, sometimes. And um, so when we look at these questions, uh, you know, number seven, which talks about the additional challenges we encounter, you know, it's an opportunity for us to explain some of those difficulties uh, that we have in servicing equipment. Um, so I, I, I uh, welcome uh, this conversation and I look forward to uh, our, our continued talks on this over the next month. Thank you, Doug. Great. Um, next person I'd like to invite actually is uh, someone I know pretty well and, and um, uh, respected opinion on a lot of these things. So um, Ryan Kleba with uh, Steris IMS. Ryan, would you like to speak to us a little bit from your perspective? Sure, thank you. Um, my background is with integrated medical systems. Uh, I've been with them for uh, just a, right at 19 years. Um, I'm responsible for our flexible endoscopy service division. So while Steris is an OEM man and a manufacturer, um, IMS is a subsidiary of Steris. IMS is, in its nature, a third-party repair company, and we specialize in flexible and rigid endoscopes as well as surgical devices such as power equipment, video cameras, etc., and, and the service of those devices. And I think that it's very important um, to note the advances in um, third-party repairs over the last even decade, but especially 20 years, and patient safety being paramount um, to, to our industry. That is a mantra that I think that everyone from the third-party industry lives by um, in today's um, 
prevalent is hospitals are making buying decisions more and more every day to partner with reputable third-party repair companies. Um, it, it's not just from a service standpoint because every third party wakes up and, and breathes and thinks about service, while OEMs typically their, their talk track is sales. But hospitals are making buying decisions not just on a spreadsheet, but they are visiting facilities. Uh, I, would, I couldn't believe how many customer fees are put out whenever they're looking at making a change from a, a manufacturer service, um, and, and they're making very smart, intelligent buying decisions. So I think that um, the reason that healthcare uh, providers are making these choices is because there's a tremendous cost savings that is provided by um, the third-party marketplace prov uh, providing this service. And again, I think someone said this earlier, the industry does police itself and there's incredible visibility and transparency um, within the service world for customers to come, the facilities, vet processes. Um, many, many times we're doing trials of, of 30, 60, 90 days where a hospital is not going to make a buying decision without um, ensuring that patient safety is paramount. So I, I welcome what the FDA is doing because the FDA knows the manufacturers and they don't know the third party industry to the extent of, I think, what they would like to know it. And I think this is a fantastic step in elevating the visibility of third parties, the value that third parties bring to the healthcare industry, and ultimately to the patient in the form of cost savings and quality repairs. And I'd like to thank uh, everyone as, uh, for allowing me to be a guest panelist today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. You sound, just so you know, your phone, you may be in an area where your phone is um, not good reception or something because you're coming across uh, intermittent occasionally, but just to give you that feedback in case later is an opportunity. Um, next, I'd like to bring up uh, Wayne Webster from IMERS. Are you available, Wayne? I'd like to make a comment? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm right here. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, so I'm a consultant. Uh, our company is called Proactix Consulting, and uh, I consult for IMERS, uh, for the board, and IMERS has been around since 1993. Involved as a trade association um, in medical imaging, involved in this very discussion and many others. So I'd suggest that people are interested in learning how trade associations deal with this sort of thing. You might look at imers.org, I-A-M-E-R-S.org. Um, I want to echo what Mary started out with. Um, I've been in the industry, either on the user side, science side, or vendor side, and now consulting for hospitals and clinics and vendors and ISOs, uh, um, don't, don't read anything into this. You're being asked some questions. If you feel like responding, be factual. Put the emotions away if you can. And uh, try very hard to uh, help people understand what you do, but don't expand beyond the question. There is nothing between the questions. I, Please don't read between the lines. I thought that was the best piece of advice I heard, and I think Mary said that right at the beginning. So um, thank you for asking me to participate. I don't want to repeat what everyone else has said and would look forward to other questions. Sure, thank you. Dave. Hey, Dave. Yes. It's yes, Mary. Can I just add one quick thing to that? Sure, absolutely. There, if people are thinking, oh, I don't really buy this is I've got some confidential or competitive proprietary business intelligence that I would love for the FDA to see, but I don't want the rest of the world to see it. There is a place in the Federal Register notice to accommodate confidential information. They would rather not have it because this is part of a, a public process, but it looks like they recognize that um, there are going to be situations where confidential information would be really helpful to them. So they've made a way to accommodate that. So please, if you have, whether it's proprietary, competitive, et cetera, if you have information that will help them, submit it. And if it's confidential, use that process. Mary, thank you for taking time to point that out. Very good observation and, and great comments. Um, I have one more person that I'd like to comment on the overall perspective, and um, I'm sure many, I won't need to really introduce him that much just because he's so well known and he was such a big asset the last time that we had an opportunity.
opportunity to, to deal with this in our profession. But with that, um, Dr. Benson Wang, are you available and would like to make comment? Thank you, Dave, for your kind uh, reference to myself. Uh, first, uh, like uh, my predecessors here, let me just introduce myself very briefly here. Uh, I came uh, actually from academia first. Uh, uh, besides uh, working at the university, I also worked at the National Institute of Health and uh, then uh, worked for uh, a medical uh, device rental company which uh, also was involved in medical device manufacturing. So I was involved in manufacturing side, OEM side. Then went to work for independent service organization and then back to work for uh, uh, manufacturer again. Uh, so uh, I have uh, a very uh, different perspective from different sides. Uh, but let me emphasize that I am not representing any former or current employer or association, uh, only myself, uh, because I believe firmly, as most of you f folks uh, seem to believe, that uh, the overall, overall goal is uh, common to all of us is the safety and performance of the device uh, through, uh, throughout its uh, useful life, uh, starting from way back, the design, etc manufacturing and then a distribution service support all the way to the end of life. And as uh, Dave mentioned, I'm a little bit older than uh, some of the folks here. I participated in the initial discussions 20 years ago when the QS regulation was first established uh, that uh, excluded uh, some of the, uh, let's say, stakeholders mentioned in this uh, new request for comment. Uh, at that time, uh, there were several reasons for that, and then subsequently in '97, an ANPR was published uh, with the intent to uh, issue some regulations, uh, and again, that uh, uh, was decided back in '98. Uh, that was uh, not to be the case, uh, uh, but I think this uh, issue was never really resolved 20 years ago. Uh, and so I'm very happy to see FDA uh, coming back to revisit uh, this whole uh, subject because uh, there are definitely some uh, impediments to uh, the common goal of safe devices for healthcare. And uh, there are definitely improvements that can be made from outside if we all work together, uh, which I know is maybe a little bit naive thinking from my part, but I think it's still possible and FDA could act as a uh, honest broker in this process and get everybody on the table to discuss and um, accept some compromises uh, from each side so we can all uh, do our best uh, for the benefit of the entire society. So I really think that uh, this initial uh, educational request from FDA is extremely important, extremely good, and I hope uh, this will eventually lead to a better understanding from our sides of the challenges and possibilities. Uh, and hopefully this time we can uh, put the issue uh, to bed once for all uh, with some uh, actions that uh, everybody uh, can agree on and uh, really uh, put in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, so here, here's some of the notes that I took just to try to capture overall what we talked about. I mean, these are just some key words that have come out of this which just illustrate they were common themes throughout everyone's comments. And again, I want to thank everybody for having provided those comments. But it was words like safety, opportunity, documentation, competencies, information, quality, visibility. I mean, these are common themes throughout everything, and, and I just want to reiterate the value of what this opportunity presents to us. And I just want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the great opportunity that we have in front of us by MD Publishing presenting this opportunity. So with that, we're going to move right along to the next thing. With the next phase, we have seven questions, which are the specific questions that FDA has asked for responses to. I'm going to randomly pick one or two people to answer each one of the questions from the panelists that we have. 
If there's a burning desire by somebody that I don't call to answer that question specifically, I would just ask that you just let me know so we can tell on you. But otherwise, I'm just going to randomly pick who I think might be best to answer the question. With that, let's go to the first one. Who are the different stakeholders involved with the medical device activities listed previously? What are their respective roles? With that, um, I, I hate to call on her again at first, but I'd like Mary to start with that answer in that question. Gee, thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, this is Mary Logan, and I, I want to point out to everybody, as a part of my answer to this question, that Amy has posted on our website a set of talking points that the whole industry can use to have internal, as a focus for having internal conversations going to your boss to say, hey, I think we ought to respond to this, or going up to the CEO of your company and saying, this is really important and here's why. So um, Dave Francoeur suggested them, that we do them, so thanks Dave. Uh, we did them and they're posted. And we also included um, in that document an outline of how to think about your response to the FDA. So it has a lot of food for thought comments to help people think through what would be helpful to the FDA. And in that document, we've talked about who are the industry segments that should respond. So OEMs, we haven't said very much today about OEMs except a lot of the folks who are on the panel have worked for OEMs uh, previously, so it came up in that context. But OEMs, parts companies, third-party service and repair companies, ISO, ISOs, in-house HTM departments in hospitals and other healthcare delivery organizations, companies that sell used equipment, companies that refurbish equipment, specialty organizations, group purchasing organizations, and anyone who is involved with or impacted by refurbishing, reconditioning, rebuilding, remarketing, remanufacturing, service, and repair. So it's basically everybody in this industry. Great. And that's exactly what I figured I'd get from you, Mary, which is the reason why I call in. Thank you so much. I would also like to call on Chris Nowak, though. I think Chris would have a good perspective on this and uh, give us a different, possibly uh, somebody in addition to or a different perspective on it. Chris, do you mind? Not at all, Dave. Thanks. Um, yeah, there's, there's a, as Mary pointed out, I, I think all of us are impacted by this uh, NPRM and uh, the request for this information. <clears throat> I, I think it also um, goes into the IT realm uh, as well. I think that's a space that uh, we don't always play well in, we being uh, the biomedical community. Um, and, and even from the OEM perspective, as, as also a person that had worked for an OEM previously as well, um, you know, we tend to think that, uh, you know, as long as my device can talk to the network, uh, that's the end of it. Unfortunately, with the medical device integration today, not only does it have to speak to the network, it has to play well with other devices that are located on the network. So, uh, so not only are the stakeholders the traditional ones that we've all talked about, and many of us uh, represent on this call today, but it's also uh, bleeds over into the IT realm uh, with uh, medical device integration. Great, thank you, and absolutely great comments. Appreciate it. Um, you know, I'm feeling fairly good that the, the responses that we've got addressed number one, or at least give you enough insight at this point. If anybody has additional questions, please, I encourage them to ask them in the chat. But I think I'd like to move on to question number two at this point. What evidence exists regarding actual problems with safety and or performance of devices that result from these activities? Specific examples should be provided. Um, I'd like to call on Dr. Wang, if you would, to address this question, if you don't mind. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, first, I must say that I have only limited access to some studies. I don't have access, for example, to uh, the post-market data that uh, ma most manufacturers have uh, and uh, so I can only refer to the ones that uh, I have access and uh, knowledge of. 
Uh, first, uh, I think uh, Jonathan gave mentioned uh, back in 1998 when FDA was uh, analyzing uh, the ANPR, uh, the uh, Acre Institute uh, group studied uh, the FDA mold reports and concluded at that time there was uh, about 240 incidents potentially related to service uh, that was therefore about 0.17 percent of all the incidents and uh, so that was the uh, um, most significant study at that time. Uh, in 2013 uh, I published on Amy's uh, BINT magazine an analysis of the Sentinel events collected by the Joint Commission uh, in the period of 2004 to 2011 and including in detail the 2011 data and I found seven incidents uh, re in the year 2011 and uh, 24.6 incidents related to equipment failure in the period of 2004 to 2011 and uh, these are possibly related to equipment failure but uh, there was not enough detail to understand whether there was indeed uh, 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 omission of any particular organization or person in, uh, in this kind of situation. Uh, so what the conclusion was arrived at that time uh, from this analysis is that uh, the uh, maintenance omission is uh, at running at uh, something like 6.5 to 6.96 sigma, uh, which is significantly better than the six sigma that most manufacturing companies are proud of. Uh, the third study that I'm aware of was a survey conducted by Amy per request of the Joint Commission uh, in 2011 uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Mills uh, gathered uh, 1,500 some uh, responses uh, and of those uh, 12 adverse events were reported but actually none of them were caused by maintenance omission uh, but by some other root causes. And then uh, in 2014 uh, a colleague of mine, a former I should say colleague of mine and I presented at the MD Expo uh, conference an analysis of a one full decade of incidents collected by my former employer, Aramark Health Care Technologies. Uh, uh, and uh, in that period, uh, almost 500 incidents uh, were uh, documented and investigated, and uh, only six was uh, found to be related to maintenance omission, uh, which uh, corresponded to 0 0.6 incident per year. Uh, and the inventory that was managed in that period of 10 years was almost 10 million pieces of medical devices and therefore we're talking about 1 million per year and uh, the corresponding sigma is 6.5 sigma. So these are the evidences that I am aware of. Uh, there are probably uh, hundreds of anecdotal evidences out there uh, that I've heard people talk about but I uh, have not had access to them uh, and does not know the statistical significance because there is no denominator. There was just uh, those uh, uh, individual incidents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it very much. I'd like to call on um, Mr. Crawford, if possible, to answer the same question. Would you mind, Jason? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, from uh, from the people that I speak with in this industry, the, the typical response to this question is that there's no evidence to suggest that the third party uh, medical device service uh, industry has any safety record that is any different, anything but a, a same or higher level of quality than the manufacturers. And, and while that has been our experience at Block Imaging as well, the reality is from the FDA's perspective today, the real issue is there's not uh, uh, visibility into that safety record. Even the safety reporting process that exists today, if there is an adverse event on a medical device, is a, is a reporting process that only takes into consideration where the event took place and who the manufacturer of that device was, not using our language in the imaging world, the assembler 
who may have been uh, involved in the refurbishment or in the service of that, of that device, I think we're at an opportunity today in our industry to say, how could we create more visibility, believing that we have an industry that is meeting a very high standard of quality and safety, but to say, how do we put within the process of reporting that already exists today uh, a method of reporting safety issues that come up, getting that safety issue down to an issue with the device, an issue with the service that was performed on that device, and who performed the service. I think we're at a place in our industry to say that if we want clarity moving forward into where safety issues or performance, issue, performance of device issues come up in our industry, how do we invite more visibility into those safety events and what may be at the root cause of those events, including the, the entity that was working on that, on that system at the time of the service safety event. Thank you very much, Jason. Well said, thank you. Let's go to number three. What are the potential risks to patients or users and the failure modes introduced as a result of performing the previously defined activities? Um, Jonathan gave, if you're available, I'd like you to comment on this if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, this is Jonathan Gave from ECRI. So, of course, there are a, a range of risks and failure modes for the immense range of devices that we have out there. So the least risky are failures that are detected via self-diagnosis by the device, and that's usually at startup or the mode may be quite visible to the operator, uh, or it's possible that the failure mode doesn't result in patient harm. And the most risky failures are those that are not evident and can deliver harm. And um, by the way, let's remember that having the device out of service is in itself a risk. You know, one of the stakeholders, two of the stakeholders that were not mentioned previously are clinicians and patients. So if you don't have the device because you have to, your in-house staff is not able to or is not permitted to fix it, well, then that device is out of service and that causes a risk for others. I think it's important for us to know that regardless of what happens with the device, it's very common in our industry to have a pre-use check before the device, after it's prepared, before it's released to service. And I think it's that pre-use check, which is well known in our industry, is something that is main, keeping a very high standard and is part of the main reason why we don't see many problems actually reaching patients. Great, thank you very much. Ryan, how about you? You want to comment on this? Are you available and can speak to it at all? Ryan Clubber? Okay, I don't, you know, Ryan, he was in a spotty area. Sorry, let's, let's move on. Um, how about, uh, let's see, how about Doug? Doug, are you available? You want to comment on that one? This one? Uh, well, yeah. The potential risk to patients uh, using whether it's uh, remanufactured uh, parts um, that ISOs we get from ISOs um, or repairs that are done by ISOs or repairs in house because we ourselves are not OEMs so uh, we're actually third parties ourselves. Um, in my experience of 31 years uh, plus, um, you know, I look back and I've you know, uh, equipment has become very reliable. Um, there are some devices, uh, life support devices, that um, for us we we only use OEM parts for. But uh, for many of the devices, we use ISOs, and uh, we invest a lot of money in uh, the test equipment that we have. And any repair that is done, we're always retesting it with uh, calibrated equipment to ensure that it's safe uh, for our patients. Um, you know, just <clears throat> I, I see very uh, few incidents in my lifetime of, uh, you know, most of the failures or problems I've seen are have to do with uh, recalls, um, uh, maybe how a device was designed or a problem with that device. And so, I think some of the comments made earlier, it, it is an opportunity uh, to, to bridge, you know, ISOs uh, into, you know, into what might have been the previous question, 
into um, the fold of recalls alerts. If, uh, if the OEM doesn't know you have that device on site, they may not send you the uh, recall alert. So that can always be a concern too. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to the next. These activities are performed by OEMs and various third-party entities, including hospitals and humanitarian organizations. Are the risks different depending on who performs them? I'm thinking Matt, Matt Tamori, how about you? Can you give us some answers to that? What do you think? I'd love to, thanks Dave. Um, Jason, Jason Crawford mentioned something earlier there, there is, that there is no evidence uh, that indicates uh, there's been issues in the industry with third-party parts. And I would say the same thing about third-party service providers. Uh, one of the other panelists mentioned uh, that the majority of service being done out there is essentially a third party, whether it's in-house or an independent service organization, asset management company. Um, we are the majority out there, and I don't believe there is a disparity. As long as there's proper training in, in place and they're using OEM spec parts from a reputable supplier, uh, I don't believe there is a difference between the OEM and, uh, and the rest of us. Great, Matt. Thank you very much. Um, actually, how about Chris Nowak? Would you like comment on this as well? Hey, thanks, Dave. Yeah, sure, I would. Um, I, I think the common denominator in this uh, question is people. Um, there's no doubt about it. Regardless if you work for an OEM, you work for a third party, you work it for a hospital, uh, it really uh, doesn't matter. As long as you're uh, a trained uh, person and you have uh, passion and commitment uh, to what your career path has been, then uh, it really doesn't make any difference if it's an OEM performing the repair, uh, a humanitarian organization, or a, a third party. Uh, it, it always comes down to the person and their commitment to their career field. And uh, I, I see this time and again. I've had a, a, uh, a tremendous opportunity in my career to see many different organizations, all that are mentioned here, uh, and it always came down to the person who was performing the repair and their commitment uh, to their career. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's where uh, the risks are, or are, are having folks, whether they are employed by an OEM or re employed by an in-house organization or a third party, if that uh, person um, doesn't have that commitment or doesn't care about their role and what they're doing, then uh, the patient is at risk regardless. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it very much. And I, I would just like to echo that. Everything you just said, I completely agree with. And the only other thing I'd add on to that is even as good or as conscientious as the individual may be, it's all about the support mechanisms that they have in place to be able to be successful. So I would just throw that out there as well. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to the next one, number five. Are these activities more difficult or riskier to perform on certain devices than others? So why don't we try, how about Binsing? What do you think about that? Uh, sorry, I had to unmute myself first. Uh, thank you, Dave, uh, for giving me uh, one of those uh, most difficult questions. Uh, I think the experience I have had in the last uh, 20, almost 30 years uh, is basically the uh, progressive introduction of uh, uh, IT software specifically to medical devices in general. And so uh, now it's becoming more and more difficult for anyone to figure out what is inside a piece of equipment because uh, uh, by looking at the embedded software chip, it does not tell you anything. Uh, and so there are certain uh, uh, diagnostics as well as functional aspects that uh, it is pretty much uh, impossible for anyone to guess. And uh, if there are issues with those things, uh, then uh, there is really no option but to go back to the source, uh, typically the OEM. And uh, as you know well, uh, some OEMs are uh, having difficulties uh, to validate the software uh, 
in an extensive, uh, comprehensive manner to make sure that uh, there are no mistakes there. Uh, we are all humans, so we cannot be perfect every single time. So we really need uh, the opportunity to learn. So what I see more and more often is that, for example, you have a comp complex med medical device system. It's not really just one device, but it's a, a system composed of several parts of several devices, and each one of them very often has its own embedded software. When you replace a board, for example, into a, a machine that has uh, a motherboard, but the, the, the board that you replace has a, uh, also embedded software. Sometimes the software the revisions are different, and then they start conflicting with each other, and you have a really very challenging time figuring what's going on. And even the manufacturers themselves uh, have that challenge. We see that when they come to uh, the healthcare facilities to fix things, and then they finally realize, oh, uh, because uh, the machine has not been uh, upgraded to a certain level, and the board that I'm bringing in is a new version, so it does not match. So now I have to do the upgrade first before I can repair the machine, et cetera, et cetera. So those uh, issues are becoming more and more common, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, is part of the dialogue cooperation that I hope uh, FDA can help to foster, because uh, as uh, one of uh, the panelists said before me, the vast majority of service is performed uh, by non-OEMs, not because the OEMs don't want to, uh, but they really don't have the capacity to do that especially in remote areas, uh, and so becoming uh, uh, really incumbent for the uh, either in-hospital team or the uh, service provider uh, that is uh, retained by the hospital to uh, get the equipment back up as soon as possible because otherwise we have a delay of care or, or denial of care even, a situation that puts patient at jeopardy. Uh, which reminds me of what happened during uh, the Y2K uh, uh, situation. There, there were many hospitals that were told by consultants to withheld the equipment. But if there is an emergency, then uh, what do you do? You tell the patient to go somewhere else and, uh, because you cannot safely use the equipment or, 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 uh, because of a Y2K concern. So I think we need to think in terms of a broader picture here and make sure that everybody has the adequate information instructions to do the proper support of the technology regardless of what's the name of the, uh, on your paycheck or, or in, on your shirt and that is I think the uh, overall goal everyone has that we need to uh, try to attain thank you thank you very much sir mr. Roman are you out there can I get you to answer this question as well Uh, yes, I, I'm. I'm back. Um, well, yeah, I I, I think that uh, Vincent did a great job uh, explaining that uh, you know things things are different, so therefore there's different risks involved with with different pieces of equipment. Um, and uh, when when you add the the individuals performing the uh, the repairs or service. Uh, and you add the need for specific uh, parts that may or may not have some uh, some level of, of um, alterations done to them. Uh, as the equipment ages, uh, you know, and, and things are found out, uh, you know, the revision levels change. Uh, so that yeah, there's a there's a tremendous amount of uh, of things that can go wrong. Um, the whether it's done by uh, the OEM or done by uh, by in-house or you know or the others as as I I call them now, um, you know the risks are, are still you know there and the risks are the same. Great, thank you very much, sir. Let's uh, let's move on to number six. What information do third-party entities need in order to perform these activities in a way that results in the safe, effective operation of medical devices? Uh, I'd like to call on Mr. Webster. Wayne, can you uh, give us some input and feedback on that? Well, I guess as a consultant, the first thing you want to be is helpful. And um, these questions are a little bit 
difficult to answer in sort of a very specific but general way. So these things that they're talking about refer back to the top six, huh? recondition, service, repair, refurbish, remanufacture, remarket. So the problem I have with this question, um, we can, I guess we can give a list of things to say this is what we need to make them safe, which then assumes that they aren't. And what I've heard people who are ISOs, and I consult for some ISOs and have over the years, I, I think we'd all agree that there's not any, any real information out there that suggests things are unsafe. So these questions are, this one's kind of interesting. I'm sorry to be kind of vague, but answering this one is difficult. If things aren't unsafe, if things aren't unsafe now, what information do we need that somehow makes them safe? It, it's just a difficult question, and I, I'm sorry to be a little obtuse, but I find when you refer back to the top um, six terms, uh, which is what we're supposed to do, this one becomes a little difficult. Great. Understand and appreciate the, the candor. You know, I think I know somebody that probably has some pretty good insight on this and, and have been in different roles and perspectives. Chris, Mr. Nowak, uh, something tells me that you probably have some insight on this. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I, I do. Uh, I think there's uh, lots of information, and I think this is what the NPRM will ferret out uh, as we go through this process. We respond back uh, by May 3rd on this NPRM. Um, the, uh, the information that I think uh, everybody needs, uh, not only third parties, uh, but again, uh, I think it's going to be a good opportunity for us to educate the OEMs of these devices what uh, uh, what we do and the information that we need to perform the activities uh, and so the education is going to go both both directions um, obviously uh, from a basic perspective documentation uh, the documentation associated with the operation the safe operation and the safe service uh, of the medical devices is essential regardless if it's a, uh, a clinical laboratory item uh, or a patient monitor, an infusion pump, or an MRI. Uh, those documents have to be uh, in the possession of the owner of the device uh, so that that owner uh, can safely and effectively either uh, contract for service or, or make a purchase decision as far as service is concerned, whether it's in-house, third party, whomever. Um, and I think from there, uh, we get into uh, uh, information that gets very specific to devices. If there's updates that the menu, I think that, that lacks uh, information from the OEM is as the OEM works through uh, an initial release of the device, subsequently there are improvements to the device once uh, items are identified, weaknesses in the system, uh, the opportunities to make the system more effective, and we go through these revision levels that been saying Dr. Uh, Wang was uh, speaking about. And I think that information coming down to us um, is very helpful in the servicing market uh, if we don't use the OEM service. Um, and, and I think, too, the Equi Institute uh, is, is another great repository of that information and could be effective in uh, uh, being, you know, some type of a disseminator or, or some type of a, uh, uh, you know, the, I, I always look to the Equity Institute as the consumer reports of healthcare, and I think they do a phenomenal job at helping us all keep the patient safe as they go through the healthcare system. So ho hopefully uh, that gives a little bit of insight as to some of the information that uh, servicers need, whether it's an OEM, a third party, or in-house, or whomever. Thanks, David, Chris, Mary, may I add? A, may I add a comment to this? Sure, please. Okay, that was that was a wonderful comment, and I'm I want to link it back to an earlier comment that someone made about how sometimes third party organizations. Uh, they have to worry about whether they're getting notices of recalls. And uh, the way that it links, those things link for me is I like to think of medical devices as being 
um, in a, li a life cycle that starts with design and development and goes all the way through to the taking device out of commission and what happens to it at that point. And there are a number of people, a number of organizations that touch that device in various ways, starting with the design and the development and the manufacturer and the shipping and the uh, installation and then service and maintenance and, and repair, refurbishing, et cetera. And when a device leaves the hands of the medical device company, it can be like dust scattering in the wind because there are so many organizations out there and the regulatory processes are become more scattered also. And so I think it's, if nothing else comes out of these conversations, then to have everyone really think about what can we do to improve the life cycle communication with one another between OEMs and everyone else in the field. That would be an awesome improvement because everybody has the same ultimate goal. It's achieved in different ways. It's thought about in different ways, but everyone has the ultimate goal of um, the safe and effective operation of the medical device to help support stronger patient outcomes. And every if everyone could work together in tandem with a seamless uh, communication flow, it would help immensely. And the previous comments just reminded me of how important that is and how much more we can all do to work together to support that. Mary, I, I agree with you, Mary. And again, I think my opening comments I touched upon, and hopefully, you know, the OEM gets educated because they do have a medical device file for all these devices that leave their facility. And, and us, whether it's a third party that maintains it or the in-house, and I've been asked today to speak from an in-house perspective, so most of my comments are coming from that uh, perspective. But it, it is so incumbent for us to manage that device history file once it hits our loading dock. Uh, and the source of truth for that is our CMMS products, our com computerized maintenance management software. It is so imperative that our staff understand the importance of documenting everything that they do on these medical devices so that in the event there is a problem, that information can get communicated back uh, uh, through the manufacturer in that device history file. So, you know, it's obvious that this is, uh, this is probably one of the biggest questions that's hitting the biggest nerve. I actually am going to call on two other people to add brief comment if they don't mind. So first would be Mr. Jason Crawford. Do you want to say a comment or so? Yeah, thanks. I, I think one of the things that I just wanted to point out is, is unique to medical imaging and particularly x-ray emitting devices is that uh, our federal government created within 21 CFR a very specific set of responsibilities on the manufacturers due to the fact that these are x-ray emitting devices. And that was that anyone defined as an assembler, um, the manufacturers have a, a responsibility and are held accountable to providing the instructions necessary for proper assembly, installation, adjustment, and testing of um, medical imaging equipment, AIAT. Uh, I know that does not today apply to every medical device that exists uh, in our industry, but what a great model for placing accountability on the manufacturers to provide simply the baseline information necessary in order to properly and safely maintain uh, medical equipment. We benefit from that in, in, the, in the medical imaging, x-ray emitting devices that we sell and service and provide parts for. I realize that not everyone in our industry benefits from that same accountability and pressure on the manufacturers to provide basic information. I don't think manufacturers should have to provide every uh, software tool, every key to make service as easy or as fast as possible, but baseline information necessary in order to properly and safely maintain equipment is something that for x-ray emitting devices, the manufacturers are responsible for providing and frankly have gotten better than what we've seen in years in their ability to provide that information quickly and efficiently. It's not perfect. But uh, as a model for us to look at in our industry and say, if assemblers of x-ray equipment are, are um, 
given access to this basic information and documentation by the manufacturers as it's spelled out in 21 CFR, um, how could we take that model and say how could we more broadly approach uh, this challenge of getting the right information into the third parties who are servicing this equipment uh, for our industry? Thank you for those comments. I'm going to call one more person, but I'm going to ask him to try to keep it brief. Dr. Wang, you want to make a comment on this, please? Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, yes. Uh, I think when uh, people read uh, this particular question, most uh, of them will come to mind uh, the so-called uh, maintenance manual. Uh, it may be software uh, uh, keys, etc. But I think we are forgetting about a significant segment of the stakeholders who are not represented apparently today, maybe partially to Ryan here, is the folks who uh, process endoscopes in hospitals and uh, ambulatory care locations. Uh, endoscopes are most definitely medical devices, and as you probably recall, uh, there were news uh, in the media uh, about patients who underwent uh, uh, procedures uh, and got uh, cross-infected with antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And uh, this is a major issue. But the reason I'm mentioning that is not only because we need to also include those stakeholders in the discussion, but also I want to emphasize one thing that I think is missing. Uh, and this is not to throw stones at anybody in particular, but in the process of doing the quality system regulation, it seems that maintenance was left as a almost like an appendix. And so although manufacturers are obligated to establish a maintenance procedure for their own people to use, uh, there is no requirement like the design of the, uh, of the device. You have a design validation, design verification and validation process. The service maintenance uh, procedure is not required to be validated. So right now we have sometimes recommendations by manufacturers that when you start reading that, you say, well, this is not even possible to do. And then you ask the OEM service representatives and they say, no, 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 we don't do that because this was written by someone who designed the device and not really who serviced the device because the order, for example, or the, the service that is called for, it does not make any sense. I have to reassemble and then disassemble the device twice in order to get this accomplished. So I think that there is a need, significant need for improvement here. Besides the access, we need also to improve the quality of the information provided so we can uh, really have a the common goal of a safe, effective device for everyone to use. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. All right, let's move on to the last question, which is kind of all encompassing and it's going to be difficult, but I'm going to ask that we kind of just, I'm going to pick two people and ask that we just kind of answer it pretty quickly and then we can move on to maybe opening up to see if there's questions from anybody. So last question, what additional challenges do we stakeholders encounter with, do the stakeholders encounter with devices that result from these activities? Um, I'm going to ask Matt Tamori to start out from that perspective. What do you think, Matt? All right, how about Ryan? Ryan, you available? I am. Can you hear me this time? Yes, sir. All right. Um, you know, if, if, if I might circle back and kind of make this all-encompassing with the last comment on the previous question, which was related to scopes and endoscopes, um, it, you know, the challenges, I think, not only as stakeholders, but the user's encounter is the difficulty in, in managing some of these devices from a maintenance and reprocessing standpoint, i.e. the manufacturers are making them uh, the instructions so complex the IFUs are unable to be followed um, even by the most knowledgeable uh, personnel that are handling various types of equipment. And I speak specifically to, uh, to endoscopes. The um, cross-contamination and subsequent um, patient deaths that are uh, you know, possibly linked to the duodenoscopes, the TJFQ180V model by Olympus and others, um, the design change that, that was made there actually made it more difficult for the uh, end users to perform cleaning and reprocessing to that device. While I think the goal of the manufacturer was not malicious, it was um, in good faith to make a better device, it was in fact harder to 
uh, handle as an end user. So I think as stakeholders, we do lack um, the information. For example, Olympus did not contact IMS when they issued a recall for their TJF Q180V. Of course, it was all over the news, and our engineering team has uh, thoroughly investigated and determined exactly the changes that were made um, to that device. Um, and of course, we will be adhering strictly to that for all post-recall devices that Olympus is serviced for future service. But it is some transparency from the manufacturers, um, and again, allowing just the basic information to stakeholders to allow the visibility of various recalls, software updates um, that all relate to what is necessary for patient safety. Thanks, Ryan. Um, let's just close it out. Jonathan, are you available? What do you think about number seven? Hello. Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, this certainly is a very broad category. I'll bring up a couple things that some of my colleagues have mentioned before. I think the greatest challenge comes from the device user interface, actually, human factors issues. Uh, this is one of the toughest areas we're all facing in keeping equipment running and keeping it running properly. Also, the issues related to device integration, that's using the device in the context of other devices in the facility. That could be devices on a network, or it simply could mean that you have different infusion pumps on different floors and made by different manufacturers, and you have to keep that all working. Addressing software patches and updates is problematic for network devices as the facility has to ensure that the changes don't impact the network or other devices on the network. And testing that patch or update in a hospital setting can delay implementation of the patch or update. I know that's very frustrating for a lot of our in-house clients. Uh, some We hear anecdotally that some manufacturers are saying, well, we recognize that there's a bug and we wish we could fix it, but then we'll have to go through another 510K approval process. I think in many cases that's not actually so, but it is something that we're hearing from the field. So it's something we'll keep our eyes and ears open about. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I, I it guess it's Mary. May I just make one uh, comment about the question itself, uh, not an answer, sure. but this, this question is a great opportunity for every stakeholder to really talk about the unique challenges encountered with devices resulting from service and repair. So OEMs have one perspective about challenges as a stakeholder. Um, ISOs might have a different challenge. Um, imaging companies might have an even different challenge. So I think every stakeholder really, this is a great opportunity to get it all out there. I hear you all when you call, when you participate in any activities, at annual conference, on webinars, et cetera. I hear all of you talk about supportability issues that you face from all of these perspectives. And this question, above all the others, is really the opportunity to talk about what your unique challenges are. Thank you, Mary. Absolutely great insight. Appreciate it. All right, so we're going to, um, at this point, we finish up the seven questions. I want to turn it back to John for a couple of minutes so he can address some questions that he's gotten from the field and whatnot, and then, I'll, and then I'd like to just wrap it up. Thanks. John, go ahead, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, we got some great questions, really good participation. Um, I've got a couple here that are really, I think, important and need to be addressed, and I'm not quite sure who uh, is the best panelist, but if you just want to chime in and, and answer it, uh, it it's, the first question is, why isn't ISO certification enough? Anyone out there want to talk uh, about John, that one? This is, John, this is Matt Tamori. Um, we, we, we've talked about the ISO certification. We received that certification some time ago. Um, ISO certification states that you have quality processes in place, but the actual specifics of, you know, if you're testing a specific device, um, you, can, you have standards, but uh, th those aren't standards throughout the industry. And so while I think ISO certification is really important, um, I, I don't think it is the end-all, be-all. Okay. Um, yeah, this, is, this is Jason Crawford. I, I would just add to that that what ISO certification gives me the opportunity to do, and, and we are Block Imaging's ISO certified, um, 
simply gives me an opportunity to, to learn from my own mistakes in order to build the quality of my operation. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting to learn from each other's mistakes and move the quality of the entire industry forward. It certainly gives each individual company who decides to become ISO certified the opportunity to improve. But how do we lift an entire industry when some are going to be on a learning curve much faster or much slower than, than our competitors? Okay, great. Uh, these are three questions, but they all kind of pertain to the same subject. So I'm going to read all three and then leave it to someone to answer. Um, and the first question of the three is, why is there no consideration for in-house as agent of owner? How will this review impact an in-house clinical engineering program where the techs performing the service work for the owners of the medical device, not a third-party provider of service? And how is the FDA reviewing in-house service support as they as they are being considered third party, even if they are owners of the equipment. Uh, who can help answer that one? So, John, this is Doug. You know, uh, I think when we discussed this before and looked at this, really in-house departments are third parties. The only person that's not a third party would be the OEM. So that one, to me, was, was pretty clear. And, so if you are and in sometimes, house, And sometimes so OEMs are third parties. Sometimes OEMs are third parties too when they do multi-vendor. Correct, and I have to work for three of them and I was both an OEM and a multi-vendor ISO. So, uh, yes, that's all really I have to say. I think that one's pretty simple there. In-house departments, just kidding, say to yourself. Uh, just my only comment would be I think the questions are valid and I think that what they're really driving towards is seeing as the healthcare institution owns the devices and the employees are uh, employees of the hospital that owns the devices, uh, there's a sense of, so, you know, why is there a concern there? It's, it, there's legitimacy on both sides and I can appreciate the question. I just don't know that it's viewed that the question's intended and asked. So I don't know that right. we can arrive at the question. Okay, great. Uh, here's the next question. This is uh, for imaging specific. Uh, when it comes to the radiology imaging industry, doesn't the regulation already in place where a physicist surveys the room for proper radiation output and radiation shielding prior to patient use suffice for all vendor modalities, whether manufacturer, ISO, or even a reseller for that matter? In the end, this is the goal for all involved? Yeah, this, is Jason. this is Jason Crawford. I can give this one a shot. Um, certainly uh, the role of a physicist uh, to, to measure dose and do uh, some basic testing to make sure that the radiation being emitted by a, uh, a piece of imaging equipment meets uh, the standards of that state. Um, patient safety goes uh, far and beyond just what uh, the dose uh, might be. Uh, when the physicist does come through uh, to do his regular audit or when a piece of equipment is being uh, installed, obviously the, the number of QA checks, the calibrations, the, the depth of image quality or lack thereof, or other service events or uh, poor preventative maintenance that could cause a potential safety issue, even if a system does meet a physicist requirement today, does not necessarily mean that it meets every safety requirement that might exist for that particular device. Okay, thank you, Jason. Looks like we got time. We're going to do one more uh, question here, and there's actually two questions, um, but it's involving the same uh, matter. Uh, where do in-house technicians get leverage to help them get service manuals and information from the manufacturer? And also, question is, as a biomed who actually fixes hospital equipment in real time at the bedside, I find that many OEMs, their procedures, their manuals, their work may fall below our professional standards. Can HTM use this as a vehicle to get OEMs to meet professional standards for things like service manuals, PM procedures, et cetera? Who wants to tackle that one? Well, this is Doug. Doug, again, I think Mary said it well on question seven, because I looked at that question seven is it's an opportunity to talk about those challenges, because I have seen an increase 
as the in-house department of more and more equipment coming in where they won't provide parts, service manuals, training, um, preventing us um, to actually provide better service and keep the equipment up for our patients. So uh, I, I think this is an opportunity, this whole docket for us to comment and, and make those comments, those challenges that each of you are having out there. Yeah, and I, I think too, uh, John, the, the leverage that your in-house team has is at the time of purchase, right? So, uh, uh, you know, the CMS process, the CMS survey process and the Joint Commission, DNV, HFAP, whoever your uh, accreditation body is for your facility has standards and part of those standards is that the clinical engineering department, the in-house department that this question refers to is must be an integral role. There has to be demonstration of an integral role in the purchasing process. So that, uh, that clinical engineering team needs to be involved and they need to, at the time of purchase, specify in the uh, uh, documents for purchase that service manuals are required. Okay, thank you, Chris. Okay, that's gonna, um, we, we've gone about our 90 minutes. I think we're, we're at uh, the last question here. Um, I'm gonna turn back over to Dave for some final thoughts. Hey, John, thanks. All I wanna do is wrap it up. I wanna wrap it up by, first of all, thanking all the panelists for their time and their expertise and their talents and the abilities to answer these questions. I also wanna thank John and MD Publishing, obviously, for hosting this and providing this opportunity for us as an industry to be able to come together the intent behind this thing was for us to inform, to give insight, and to give some thought around what these questions were, how they were representative, and how individuals might be able to, um, you know, answer these questions. So I, I leave us with this. Again, thanks to everybody, but I'd like to actually take a quote out of something that Mary put together. At this moment, FDA is simply asking for information. If it decides to make some regulatory action, it should be based on a complete understanding of the industry. So hearing from as many organizations as possible is very important. So that's our call to action, folks. We've had an opportunity to have these few calls. We have another one coming. You know, it's, you, we've done everything we can to educate everybody. I challenge everybody on this call. There were over 390 people at one time. I challenge everybody to go reach out to five more people and ask them to respond to the FDA. Let's educate and inform. With that, I want to thank everybody for this opportunity, and I hope everybody responds. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, again, on, on, on behalf of MD Publishing, I think this was a, a, a home run webinar. We certainly got the word out to a broad uh, uh, base for the industry. I'm going to remind everyone there will be a post-webinar survey that will come to you. There um, will be a few questions in there, and there will also be a chance for you to leave additional comments. And any of the questions that we did not get to, we will forward on to the panelists, and hopefully they can respond to you um, with, with some more information to help you better understand. I uh, can't thank everyone and, enough, the panelists. Yes? And John, this is Mary. I just want to remind everybody, if you need uh, help talking about this in your organizations, just go to Amy's website, and you can easily find and download the talking points and uh, food for thought about how to comment. Thanks for adding that, Mary. That's aami.org. Please go visit that website and um, uh, take Mary's advice. That's a great, uh, great vehicle to get that word out. So again, post-webinar survey coming. Well, if you're at the, fortunate enough to be in Dallas for the MD Expo, we'll have a live meeting to talk about this as well because uh, folks may third will be here before we know it, and let's get everybody on the website to leave as many comments as we can. Thank you again to everyone. Have a great rest of the day, and we will see you next time. Thank you.